Hi, welcome to another episode of Cemeteries Down Under. We're here at the All Saints Cemetery in Parramatta. There's nothing saintly about it. It has a very sad history. Now, behind us, the gravestones that you see are for the notable pioneer characters, people that settled in the area, in the Parramatta area. Um, this cemetery was opened in 1840, but there's 1,500 unmarked graves of the destitute, uh, the mental asylum victims, the local orphanage that they had open at the time. It's got a very sad history, so let's take you around and tell you about it and show you some of the headstones that are here. Thank you, guys. So this is All Saints Cemetery and a plaque. So All Saints Cemetery has a plaque and it tells you how it started. The site known as All Saints Cemetery was in use from the 1830s. While most burials occurred in the second half of the 19th century, it was used occasionally throughout the 20th century. The last burial was in 1992, around 2,000 people are known to be buried here, some 1,500 in unmarked graves, poor, insane, abandoned, destitute and soon forgotten. Most died as inmates of the Parramatta Lunatic Asylum, Parramatta Jail, the Female Orphan School, Parramatta Orphan School and other institutions in the area. The remaining gravestones mark the resting place of Parramatta citizens from a range of social backgrounds, including many from prominent families of the area. All those known to be buried here are listed on this wall in order of the date of their death. It's very sad. There's a lot of people that wouldn't be known to be buried here. So we can only assume there's 2000 burials. And like the poor people that were forgotten, it's almost like this cemetery is forgotten also with the long grass and the way it's kept. Here we have, look at this, Sarah Jane Morley, the 17th of February 1849, only three years, two months. Henry Davis, the 20th of February 1849, only two years, six months. Jane Blakery, six years. Catherine Blakery, 12. You can only imagine these poor children um, forgotten, unloved in these orphanages and how they died. Here you go again, we've got Charles, five years, nine months, Mary Ann Duffy, three years, nine months, as well as the people here that are older. Male, adult, name unknown. We don't even have a date of how old they were. And we've got Elizabeth Jones, six years. And the list goes on and on, guys. And all up. There's 24 plaques here, filled with names of the unmarked graves. So all of these victims here would have been broke, poor, 
destitute. You know, they would have had very hard lives or even unwanted children. They would have been abandoned in these orphanages. And um, we don't know what their lives were like or how they died, but um, we can only assume that they were all tragic. So this open field you see here are just filled with unmarked graves. No markers, no nothing. And as well as the victims from the orphanages and the jail and the lunatic asylum, there was a, a great number of the Chinese community that lent up in the lunatic asylum, obviously trying to start a new life in Australia, maybe a better one. And um, there's no footprint of Chinese existence in Australia apart from very few documents and a memorial plaque in the cemetery and you can only wonder if their families overseas ever found out what happened to them or even knew that they died and was buried here. It's very sad. The female orphan school opened from 1813 to, and it closed in 1850 Overcrowding was always a problem. The children didn't have proper facilities to eat. Um, given a spoon, sometimes they ate with their fingers. Um, you know, they weren't given proper clothing and there was always speculation of abuse and sexual abuse going on in the orphanages until it closed. Overcrowding remained a persistent problem and in 1888 the former Protestant orphan school at Rydomi was converted into a hospital for the insane and was annexed to the Parramatta Asylum until 1892. The hospital also utilised the aged St Parramatta Jail complex from 1918 until 1922. In 1923 a Royal Commission recommended that the Agedson Girls Industrial School be repurposed as a hospital for the criminally insane. However, this never eventuated. It was quite usual for an entire family of siblings in dire circumstances to be admitted to an orphanage. For instance, the Connolly children, Cecilia, James, Julia, Mary and Thomas, whose mother Henrietta had been found dead in the goldfield in a miserable hut comprised of torn gunny bags. In the hut were two boys, aged six and eight. Their mother died of disease caused by insufficient shelter and nourishment after giving birth to twins, with one found in her dead mother's arms and the other cradled by the younger boy who sat crying because his mother would not wake up. The father had left in search of work. The Parramatta Female Factory was multi-purpose. It was a place of assignment, a hospital, a marriage bureau, a factory, an asylum and a prison for those who committed a crime in the colony. The reason it is called a factory is because it manufactured cloth, linen, wool and linsey. There were over 200 women and children in a place that could only house 30 at night. The factory was the destination for many of the convict women sent as prisoners to the colony of New South Wales. Over 9,000 names have been recorded as passing through the work factories, of which an estimated 5,000 went through the one in Parramatta. It was also the site of the colony's first manufactured export, producing six thousand yards of woven cloth in 1822. The women also did spinning, knitting, straw plating, washing, cleaning duties and if in third class, rock breaking and oakum picking. In 1827 the factory was the site of Australia's first industrial action when women noted as a response to a cut in rations and poor conditions. By 1842 the factory accommodated 1,203 women as well as children. With the end of the convict transportation in the colony, in 1848 the site was reassigned as a convict lunatic and invalid asylum. 
Parramatta Work Factory and then Asylum was described by one person as a frightful old factory, prison at Parramatta with its doleful cell and iron bar doors. Criminally insane patients were a big feature of Cumberland Asylum, with its location near the now decommissioned Parramatta Jail. One of Australia's most notorious serial killers, Albert Mad Mossy Moss, was housed at Parramatta Asylum for seven years until 1933. It is believed the career criminal carried out his first murder in January 1933, shortly after he got out of the asylum. He killed swagmen who were travelling through the bush and on unpopulated roads. When in prison, Moss claimed that he had killed at least 13 people. Not all that were in the asylum were hardened criminals, however. A lot of innocent people were in there too. Disobeying your husband was a good enough reason to be committed to an asylum in the 1800s, as well as drunkenness and sexual impertinence, having venereal disease, or being homosexual, all great reasons to be committed to an asylum. Other listed conditions included mania, dementia, melancholy, relapsing mania, hysteria, epilepsy and idiocy. In the nearby Rydalmere Psychiatric Hospital, electric shock treatment was a common practice in Sydney asylums, but sometimes workers used electricity for torture, not treatment. Two ex-patients told the Lunacy Commission in 1923 that they had seen electric batteries applied to the feet of the patients at Rydalmere Psychiatric Hospital. The patients couldn't speak or walk afterwards, so the doctors then decided to stimulate the patient with an electric coil. Another article stated that the coils were applied to the patient's feet and ears as punishment for tearing a blanket up. Rydalmere was established as an asylum in 1888 after the orphan school closed. About 17% of deaths in Rydalmere were due to unexplained disease described as maniacal exhaustion. However, some information can be gleaned from accounts recorded by staff. Even in the 1920s, doctors were concerned by the poor conditions at the asylum. A Dr Edwards described his experience of starting at Rydalmere in this way. Rydalmere was an introduction to the lunatic asylum at its worst. With one exception, the female convalescent ward. The wards were dingy and dirty and old. The wards were even more repelling and soul killing inside. Most of the rooms were painted a dull green or a peculiar, unattractive shade of brown. Nearly all floors were washed every morning and the damp bare boards for hours afterwards added to the asylum smell of urine, feces and unwashed bodies. For most of its history, the patients of the Rydalmere Lunatic Asylum were given standard uniforms. Men were given shapeless clothes made of coarse grey tweed, a cloth hat and heavy boots. Women were given a shapeless dress made of strong blue or grey fabric. Dr Edwards noted that this was a source of constant shame and hostility amongst the women. We can only imagine the horror that these people faced in the asylums and the work factories and the poor children in the orphanages and the fact that they're lying now in unmarked graves. We've only got a handful of names on that panel so we don't know where they're buried or what their lives were like. is just a tragedy. So where this pole sits there was a little plaque or a sign saying they found the remains of two small children buried in this area, names unknown. Um, but sadly it seems like somebody's taken that away too. One here, sacred to the memory of Mary Elizabeth Barber. Um, died March the 31st, looks like 1907, aged, uh, honey, is it 21? 
dialect and two. No, here. Uh, uh, no, number. One year. One year and five months or so. Frederick George Barber died June the 2nd, uh, aged two years and nine months. And that's really faded. But obviously they're the children of more prominent families um, because the ones in the orphanage didn't have a marker at all. It's very sad still. This lovely headstone here is sacred into the memory of Caroline Jane Gettums. Um, a little bit faded. Don't have the 1880 something. Yep, and then you got James Tut, um, who died June 1880, might be nine aged I can't see it's very faded guys maybe they'd be more one of the notable people but I do love their pattern at the top of the tombstone so here on this old fence Got a plaque sacred to the memory of Ethel Ellen Grant, who died April the 19th, 19, 1864, aged only 14 months. And this tombstone looks a bit broken now. And it's in memory of Alexander O. Is it Seal? Grant? Um, died May the 12th, aged 65 years, so it must be their baby that they lost. So this one, family plot, beautiful fence around it, it's now a bit rusted and unloved. And you've got a memory of William Gooden, born March the 23rd, 1812, died December the 26th, 1886. Also, Standish George, son of William and Charlotte Gooden, died January the 18th, 1905, aged only 39. A beautiful fence. beautiful tombstone here. Someone's placed a little teddy on it. It's got the urn with the drapery. And that's George Turtle who died the 3rd of February 1895 aged 58. Also his wife Priscilla who died the 5th of August 1869 aged 32. Also their daughter Elizabeth might be Mia who died 30th of June 1870, only seven years old. And also Emily Gooden, who died the 27th of February 1855, aged 16. It's very sad, the children, and they all pretty much died young. So this one here, surrounded by the beautiful fence and the drapery on the urn up the top. And it's to the memory of Emily Mange, died the 13th of November 1862, aged 12. Also Amy Mange, died 13th December 1865, aged only 6 days. Also Edith Emmeline Mange, died the 6th of January 1860, died 13 months, suffer little children to come upon me. Um, something about the glory of God. Also Lillian Constant Mange died looks like the 1st of March 1850 aged only six years. 
But remember, these children came from the more prominent families in the area, and there's so many here that are gone and forgotten. No marker at all to even commemorate their life. So here you would have one of the most prominent characters, Edward Waldegrave Wardley, MRCSL, um, superintendent. So he would be superintendent of the police, of the, can you see what that is? He might have been a prison warden too, um, at Parramatta, died um, May the 20th. And it's almost like 1872, age 55 years. Beautiful stone. The art on this one is just gorgeous. With the cherub and the angel face. And it's memory of George Hanley died looks like could be May I'm not quite sure age 55 years it's very faded and then you've got Grace um, wife Grace it's very um, faded but I just love the cemetery art on it would have been a very beautiful stone once This one's gorgeous as well. And the artwork on that. And that's Christina. Uh, it could be the relics, it could be the wife of James Fay, um, who departed in this life. Doesn't really, oh hang on, 1876 I see. Let me just check with my torch. I forgot I had that in my hand. Okay. 1870. And it's July the 10th. Yeah. I can't really see much more, it's very faded. But again, the artwork's just incredible on this stone. Right at the end of this cemetery we found this bench with this plaque. It says in loving memory of Ernesto William 16th of January 1938 to the 13th of September 2013. Beloved husband, father and nono, proud and passionate local resident of North Parramatta, a man who enjoyed a chat, a game of cards or chess. He sounds like a beautiful man and rest in peace and what a beautiful bench they put in memory of him. He obviously sat here and talked to the locals or people walking past or just chilled out. This beautiful tall monument here, um, we are hoping to be able to read but when we got close up, most of the writing on it is very um, faded but you can see down the bottom there's Mabel. Bud Verencamp and Charles Emile Verencamp. Beautiful big stone, so with the fence around it, um, they would have been very prominent in the area. I'll try and find some history for you. You've got quite a big area, quite a few graves, so they might be the original settlers, the Moxhams. And then we've got the descendants here. And we've got Robert Henry Moxham, died April. 1880, age 57. Robert George Moxham died December 
1887, aged nine months. Isaiah Taylor Moxham died June 1860, aged nine weeks. Sons of the above, also Martha Moxham, wife and mother of the above, died March the 28th, 1882, aged 60. Now I know the Moxhams were related to the First Fleet and the Moxhams would have been like um, back then they were mainly orchards and farmlands here and they would have been the original settlers and quite prominent in their business of orchard farming. Also Henry Moxon um, died 51 years, Mary Louisa, William Robert um, you come around here, I can't read all the dates, but I'm doing my best. And you got Emily Martha Hay, uh, daughter of William and Catherine Moxham. And then you've got Catherine J. Hay, 1908 to 1982. So we've got some of the newer graves here. We can't read this one. Um, and... So over here, and I've got W.D. Moxham, Wilder Audrey Moxham, wife of Cyril, mother of John and Roderick, who passed away in 2019, aged 102 years. That's quite a milestone. And you've got Cyril Stewart Moxham, husband of Wilder father of John and Roderick who passed away on August 13, 2006, age 94. Wow, so they actually lived quite a long, long time. Good, good milestones for both of them. And here we've got um, W.D. Moxham from the regiment, uh, aged only 43, 1961. And you can see more mops and headstones at the back there, but it's very faded. One down here. But it's a huge down plot. And we've got a couple here. And we've got Paul J.H. Moxon, 17th of April 1936 to 23rd of June 2015. Loving memory of Paul Joseph Fergus Moxton. He lived and loved life to the full. He is sadly missed by his wife, Sveti, his daughters Tara, Justine and Petrina, sons-in-law and seven grandchildren. And here we've got a gunner, D.K. Moxon, uh, medium regiment, 20th of November 1957. He was only 41. So rest in peace, sir, and thank you for your service. Here we've got Charles Francis Prudames died April the 10th, 1906, age 72. Francis, 1861, 11 days. Charles, uh, 1875, 3 years, 5 months. Ethel, 1878, 1 year, 9 months. Charles, 1890, 8 years, 8 months. Also, Susanna Matilda Prudames, beloved wife of the above. Died September the 9th, 1918, aged 73 years and 11 months. Also, Thomas Walter died December the 27th, 1919, aged 45. Mildred died September the 10th, 1940, aged 56. Catherine died February the 12th, 1941, aged 65. And Elsie May Kirkman died September the 17th, 1949 age 70. Also got some descendants here, got a little plaque here. Alexander, and looks like he died the 9th of July 
And then we've got Gladys. 1914 to 2007. Judith, Michelle, over here. Um, beautiful daughter of Bill and Glad. And we've got another one here. Served in the army, William Charles. Looks like he was in the Australian Infantry. Um, thank you for your service, sir. And here we've got Jenny and George. Uh, there's stones a little bit faded. Um, looks like it might have been up there once, but it's fallen down. So here we've got two old tombstones and this one's Henry Pollard of Somerset, died the 20th of July 1883 and his wife Martha Brooks of Devon died 9th of December 1863. Dedicated to the memory of these early settlers and their, by their descendants in 2000 on the 16th of October. Henry's arrival day in New South Wales in 1814. So it's lovely that some relatives have done something. Um, yeah, that's Henry Bennett, a different one. He died in November. Um, can't really tell the numbers anymore, but it's age 72. But, um, So here we've got to the memory of George Watt, who died again. It was only age 34, also Eden, Edith Annie Watts, who died very um, bad with the writing. It's all faded, aged only two years, no, aged two years and something months. Also Grace Watts, age seven and ten months. Now do excuse the noise. Um, this is in middle of a residential area of flats and on the outer skirts of Parramatta City. So we do have a lot of traffic and people walking past. Hey guys. Hi. Hope you enjoyed this episode of All Saints Church Cemetery in Parramatta. Um, just makes me sad, you know. There's so many forgotten people buried here. We'll never know pretty much how many. Uh, we've got a few names and a few ages, but it's almost like this cemetery is forgotten like the people buried here. Um, it's very unloved, you know long grass we have had the rains but um, 
you could do with a bit of TLC and really the only stones that you can read are the prominent families that settled here and um, even they're a bit run down and um, just leaves me feeling really sad with a hole in my heart um, you know they all had lives and they would have struggled and um, especially the forgotten ones who knows how they end up in the asylum or the orphanage or the jails we just don't know what their lives were like back then but um, it just makes me sad okay well until our next adventure hope you've enjoyed this little tour and we'll see you next time. Thank you see for you watching. Guys.